Hi everyone, here's the Bookamis once again. Today I'm reviewing Atonement by Ian McEwan, arguably his most famous novel and one of the most acclaimed novels in contemporary British fiction. This video is sponsored by Skillshare, which is an online community of creators and experts offering video classes on a variety of topics from illustration, creative writing, um, web design and so much more. I'll talk about it at the end of the video, but you should know that there is a link um, in the description box that will give the first thousand people to click on it, two months of free subscription to Skillshare, and I do recommend you check the website out because it's great. Atonement is the most literary of literary novels, and I, I say literary and I'm speaking about the specific genre of literary fiction, which in my conception, which I take from Michael Chabon, who developed it in his essays, in his nonfiction, it's just one genre among others, just in the same way as science fiction has certain tropes and relies on certain uh, narrative elements and features that are very common among its stories. For instance, spaceships, aliens, uh, the clash with a different civilization as a way of reflecting on the quirks and the problems of humanity. And literary fiction too relies on a lot of tropes, including misplaced letters, uh, misinterpreted feelings, misunderstood situations, and in general the clash of different intellects and different people looking at the world and looking maybe at a few specific scenes in different ways and usually, and especially in the case of atonement, in tragically different ways. Atonement's commitment to the psychological characterization of the people inhabiting its pages is impressive. The novel focuses so uh, in such detail on the thought processes and on the reflections of its characters that sometimes it slow, it, its pace slow down so much that nothing really happens for a stretch of several pages other than the narrator reflecting and focusing exactly on the mechanisms of a character's mind. At times, the rhythm and the speed of the narrative almost grinds to a halt. It's no Ulysses, but at the same time, a good portion of this a relatively longish novel is dedicated to the description of a single summer day, although by all means a quite an eventful summer day. I'm not saying this in any way to discourage you because the writing is always so effervescent and interesting that even in these slower passages I was always hooked, you are going to, you're always uh, curious to read more, even just to experience McEwan's ease with word and wordplay. But at the same time, the, the first half, definitely the first half of this book is what I like to call dense writing, meaning writing that packs a lot of complex reflections and difficult representation of psychological complexities in uh, without pushing forward the narrative or the character's development too fast. Speaking of the prose, I said that the writing is always interesting, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that interest is always positive. Now, I am a, a, an absolute fan of purple prose, of complex writing, I adore it. My, my favorite writers, Pinch and Lovecraft, Chabon, all write in a, in a rather baroque style, but the problem with purple prose is that it's very exceedingly easy to overdo it, and all of a sudden your, write, your writing doesn't, doesn't read as baroque anymore, but it just read either like a, a science textbook using very specific lexicon or like a thesaurus. Atonement did feel like that at times. At times it felt like the narrative was trying to be a little bit too eccentric with its terms and its lexicon and its ways of phrasing. Although I'll have to say something about that later into the video, actually very soon, and I believe the novel eventually made a fool out of me. The game of showing and concealing going on in the novel is masterful. The narrator throws at you just as much as you need to know when it comes to reconstructing the events at, in this uh, country house during the course of this summer day, just as much so that you can infer what's happening and maybe sometimes make a false guess in terms of who's responsible for a certain event, what's actually going on with a, with a specific character. 
and not a not one page too much is provided to you you have to reconstruct some of these events but that's part of the pleasure of the experience of, of discovering about this, this the, the tragic events that unfold in this country house and similarly the book is split in different parts in three main parts each of which has a different theme a different vibe a different narrative style a different pace and rhythm overall atonement is nothing if not a virtuosistic writerly performance finally one thing i wanted to remark on is that my favorite character considering that the various personalities and psychological workings of all these different characters are represented usually um each each chapter in the in the first part of the novel is focalized through the perspective of a different character my favorite one was easily emily the the head effectively the head of the household since her husband is away from for work most of the time she's played by migraines she's confined to her bedroom a lot of the time but she, still she has to handle everything that goes on in this country house and she's constantly worrying about things that are absolutely silly but still are extra are crucial to 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 her world and her life stuff like dining arrangements uh, the menu for for a dinner party and these sorts of rich people silliness she is weary and miserable she is petty but also strangely dignified and i found her a much more humane much more complex and satisfying character to to get to know than hunky genius robbie uh the impetuous heroine uh, cecilia and definitely more than that brat byrony but that's as much as i can say to those of you who haven't read the book and were looking for a recommendation or a take on it i absolutely recommend it it's a, a classic of contemporary fiction if you pardon the oxymoron and although i i'm afraid i made it sound as hard work it really isn't. It flows beautifully even in its lowest moment and it's going to reward you uh, especially much if you put some work into it, but it's also a pleasant story to experience people by, by great characters, even if you're just looking for a good read and, and nothing more. So I do recommend the book. But um, for those of you who read the book or uh, those of you who haven't, please come back in the future because I want to talk about Atonement with you guys. I'm going to, to get spoilery and say that yes, uh, everything we've read, the purple prose I mentioned, the, the dynamics of the characters makes so much sense once you realize, as I kind of suspected, that what we've been reading is actually uh, narrated by Byrony. She is the narrator, she is the writer, everything comes from her perspective. In that sense, the purple prose that I found so annoying is actually genius because Byrony is narrating the events in this summer house in the tone she had when these events happened as a 13 year old aspiring writer who was just very fond of the dictionary and just like to throw in a complicated word, word every once in a while uh, the twice in this novel um, the narrator speaks of parallelepipedes 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 anyway plural parallelepipedes of light and i found that so obnoxious but then again it's actually genius because what happens here is what narratologists call uh linguistic contagion which is when the narrative a third person external unfocalized narrative takes in some of the the speech patterns of the character that the narrative is following so that the two technically separate uh, consciousnesses kind of blend into one another that might or might not make sense it's a rather complicated concept i'm not the clearest of people uh, um, suffice it to say that the way the novel takes on um, the prose of uh, um, Byrony uh, in her early age while she, while it's talking about her is quite genius. It, it, it's great writing, truly. Similarly enough, what I said about the characters, about the fact that Robbie and Cecilia look really like a hero and a heroine in this novel might be due to the fact that Byrony, because she's aware of all the suffering she caused them, because this book is literally called Atonement, might wish consciously or unconsciously to portray them as better than they were just because she feels guilty at all the pain 
terrible, immense pain she caused them. I appreciated the final twist, the revelation of Byronie's identity as a narrator and the even stronger twist that follows that revelation. Of course I appreciated it, it's, 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 it's quite brilliant, it made me cry like a baby. It reminded me a lot of the twist in Sweet Tooth, which is another Ian McEwan novel I read several years back, which I adored. In fact, I want to talk uh, in detail about that twist, but let's just say that Sweet Tooth is really happy atonement, or that atonement is really sad Sweet Tooth. And if I say that, it's because part of me kind of believes that maybe I liked Sweet Tooth more, even though I think that's considered a rather minor later work. And again, as I said at the beginning, Atonement is generally regarded as McEwan's masterpiece. Now, let me explain. I liked Atonement very much. I found its final twist cute as hell. I appreciated the novel. It's beautiful. I'm so happy I read it. But Atonement is a book that's cl that clearly is committed to saying something important about the craft of the writer, about the purpose of writing, the job of the writer, the reason why we write and read literature. As somebody who uh, is a s literature scholar, who reads books and thinks about books uh, sort of a lot, uh, this <sighs> reading this book I agreed with some of McEwan's reflections, I disagreed with some of the others, but I felt a little bit like a marine biologist watching Joe's or some other shark movie. There's many videos uh, on YouTube that are, that are hilarious about, again, um, marine biologists watching Joe's and commenting of the, on the scientific accuracy of it, or, say, doctors watching Grey's Anatomy or OusMD and commenting on the medicine that's dropped in the show. Somehow, because I felt like the book was dealing with what I consider to be my field of professional expertise, I couldn't necessarily accept it wholesale and embrace it with the innocence and the, the acceptance that the novel demands, but I was a little bit skeptical. I felt like I couldn't really relax and step back and appreciate the, the novel's points wholesale the way they're supposed to be taken, but I was always a bit weary of them, just a tiny bit. Again, I, it's not like I disagree with what McEwan says about writing in the book, not, not at all. Maybe just every once in a while, it's more that I didn't think that I could really relax and just appreciate the story with the suspension of disbelief it required. That's absolutely and 100% just my problem, and it might sound a bit convoluted as an explanation, and it's partly, if I have to be honest, it's just the way I found of explaining why I didn't feel like the book stayed with me for very long after I finished reading it. Definitely, it stayed with... I, I, I read it a month ago now, and it definitely stayed with me less than books like 2666 or Jane Eyre, which I read earlier in the year and which are also literary novels that try and make a po some points about the nature of writing and try to make broader points about the nature of consciousness and existence other than just telling an interesting story people with compelling characters. So I hope the points I raised in the review weren't too confusing or convoluted and I'm definitely curious to hear what you people thought about Atonement because I do believe it's a great novel novel, and I know many people consider it a masterpiece. I look forward to discussing it with you in the comment section below. Thank you so much, as always, for watching the video, and thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring it. As mentioned at the beginning, Skillshare offers a variety of classes with a beautiful community feeling to them. There are sections to each of, it, of these video classes where you can share your work with the fellow students taking this class, maybe share your illustrations if you're taking a drawing class, or your stories if you're taking a creative writing or a memoir writing class, which I suppose is also creative writing, well, why am I even distinguishing? Uh, a class that I liked recently, I liked it very much, was a productivity masterclass by Thomas Frank, which in a very engaging, very fun way, didn't feel like homework at all, uh, taught a few tricks and tips on how to keep productive, how to organize your day, how to stay on top of everything you need to do, which is definitely useful in today's
this context where I work from home, so many of us work from home, and in general, many of us have to organize their time and handle it as efficiently as possible. And I thought I was good at this stuff. I did a PhD for three years, and if I can say so myself, I was quite effective at it. And still, I learned so many things from this masterclass. I highly recommended it. Uh, and I do recommend you check out Skillshare's offer, try a few classes, uh, click on that link in the description box, which will give first thousand people's, uh, people to click on it. Two months free subscription, even beyond those two months, uh, Skillshare is very, um, very cheap. A yearly subscription is less than $10, uh, $10 a month. I don't know what's happening to my, my speech. I think I best end the video. Thanks to Skillshare and thanks to you guys for watching. Bye, guys.